Okay, so hello there and welcome once again. This is section two of Econ 311, which is microeconomics one. And I will take you through the concept of consumer behavior by this time looking at another school of thought, which is the ordinal utility approach to demand, the ordinal utility approach to demand. So basically what this session will try to do is to introduce you to another school of thoughts which um, based on the criticisms of the cardinal utility concept we discussed in section one, they have proposed a better um, measurement or valuation of how consumers behave with respect to the demand theory. So the section outline, I'll look at introduction, um, I'll look at indifferent scares, properties of the indifferent scare, the budget line, um, consumer equilibrium, taxes, subsidies, and rationing are uh, all the issues that we'll discuss in this section. In terms of the section outline, by at the end of the period, you would have a good appreciation or working knowledge in the cardinal utility approach to demand and all the pointers that have been listed on the slides. The reading list for this section is chapter four of Jeffrey M. Peloff, right, which is microeconomics or any other a microeconomic textbook that is available to students which treats the ordinal utility approach to demand. So in terms of the ordinalist utility approach, the question the ordinalist asks is the measurability assumption of the cardinalist. They believe that individuals cannot objectively measure the satisfaction they get from consuming a good. They propose rather that people will be able to rank their satisfaction. So you can tell us that on any given day when you have a plate of jollof um, for lunch, your satisfaction is higher than when you have a plate of kinky, right? It means that you are ranking your satisfaction instead of measuring it. So the ordinal utility approach is based on setting key assumptions. First of all, is the assumption that the consumer is rational, meaning that the consumer is always seeking to maximize utility given his income meaning the consumer always would want to prefer more to less. Then the consumer cannot quantify utility but can measure it. Closely related to these assumptions is the assumption of consistency in the behavior of the consumer. And here with consistency, what this means is that in any given day, if A is preferred to B, under no circumstance would the consumer prefer B over A, right? It means that if A consumer prefers a plate of rice over a plate of kinky, then it means that the consumer should not change his or her mind if a plate of rice is available and go and pick kinky. So every time this consumer will pick a plate of rice over a plate of kinky, that is what we mean by consistency in the choice of the consumer. Then, um, closely related to the consistency assumption is also the concept of transitivity, meaning that based on the consistency of choice, we can predict what the consumer will do. And with transitivity, we know that when A is preferred to B and B is preferred to C, the consumer under no circumstance would prefer C over A. Right, I repeat, if A is preferred to B and B is preferred to C, then based on the transitivity assumption, we can tell that A is preferred to C, right? Meaning the consumer is behaving consistently and we can predict the behavior based on the pattern we observe. So what is an indifferent scale? As you may be aware in your elements of economics and the micro, we know that is a locus of points that show different combinations of goods and services that yield the same level of satisfaction, right? So um, the consumer in choosing between two goods, right, in consuming two goods, sorry, the consumer will indicate a point of satisfaction which um, 
they are indifferent of, right? So on this indifference curve, we see that I C one points A, B, and C are all points that yield the same level of satisfaction to this consumer. So here, when the consumer has 14 apples and 20 bananas, the satisfaction they derive is the same as having 10 apples and 26 bananas, and the principle follows. So all points on this indifference curve yield the same level of satisfaction to this consumer right so in terms of the characteristics or properties of the indifference curve indifference curves are negatively sloped we'll get to that mainly because of the trade-off that the consumer does so you see that moving from point a to point b the consumer has to give up some apples to take some bananas right so that is why we have this negatively sloped nature. It's convex to the origin, meaning there is diminishing marginal rate of substitutability, right? So here, what this means is that when the consumer is getting more of one commodity, then they become unwilling to sacrifice the commodity they are losing to get more of the one they already have. So when you look at this, you can tell that when the person has 14 apples and 20 bananas, they are willing to sacrifice four apples to take how many bananas? Six bananas, right? But as you go on, this scale is not quite standard, but as you go on, you see that the consumer will consistently be unwilling to sacrifice more apples for bananas because they have more bananas. And that is the concept of diminishing marginal rate of substitution. So in terms of some scenarios where we have indifference curves that are not supposed to exist. We have a situation we call impossible indifference curves. And in this scenario, one is a situation where indifference curves cross each other, right? So um, before we go, I go on to this. We have this indifference curve. And we know that an indifference map is a collection of indifference curves. So here we can have hundreds of indifference curves that are up, moving up. Indifference curves that are farther away from the origin yield higher satisfaction. So if I had an indifference curve here, I see two, the satisfaction would have been more because the consumer would have more of both goods. So let's go back to the impossible indifference curves. When you look at this, you can tell that this blue indifference curve, I, um, indifference curve I0, to the left of point E yield higher satisfaction than indifference curve I1, right? But the moment they cross each other, you can tell that the satisfaction levels change. Why? Because at this point, they take a different turn. So when you look at point E and point B on indifference curve I1, this individual is indifferent between E and B, because E and B yield the same level of satisfaction, right? And then when you take indifference curve I0, points E and A yield the same level of satisfaction. So if you remember based on the concept of transitivity, it means that this individual should be indifferent between A and B. But obviously, looking at these two curves, point B is a superior point than point what? A. So this makes a situation where the individual would obviously prefer point B over point A because it gives them more of the bundles of the goods available, right? So when you look at this, you can tell that point A comes with lower values of both pizza and burritos, which are the goods that the consumer is consuming. And then point B comes with more of both. So a rational consumer would obviously choose point B over A. And this is the reason why indifference care should never cross each other. The other scenario is a situation where we have an indifference curve which is upward sloping like this. And based on the same concept, 
on this, we can tell that point B is a more superior point to point A, but they are all lying on the same indifference scale, which is not possible because the consumer would obviously choose B over A. Um, but when it happens like this, it means that the consumer is indifferent. And this is the reason why it is not possible to have this type of indifference scale. The other scenario would be a situation where we have a very thick indifference curve like this. We know that in your basic micro you are taught indifference curves are every weddings, right? But in this scenario we see that this is a very thick, they are every weddings but they don't touch each other. But here it is very thick which shows that we can plot two different points on this indifference curve and point B is obviously superior. So this is a scenario that should also not exist. In terms of the curvature of indifference curve, there are certain scenarios where indifference curves may not take your typical convex um, type um, nature. A scenario one scenario is when you have perfect substitutes. And what are perfect substitutes? Goods that serve the same purpose but are different, right? So you can choose between A and B. Your typical perfect substitute examples we usually use are Coke and Pepsi. Why? Because when you pour Coke and Pepsi in a glass, you cannot tell the difference, right? So for substitutes goods, um, if the consumer has a choice of picking one over the other, they would always pick one and not combine. So the rate of substitution is one. So it gives us a perfect straight line and it follows the law of indifference curves where higher indifference curves yield higher satisfaction levels. Then we come to perfect complements, which are goals that have to be combined to give a given level of satisfaction. So they are combined in consumption. Examples of complementary goods would be um, a gas stove and a gas. Um, you would have to look at the torch light and battery, right? So if you have more batteries, it doesn't mean you have more exposure of light so far as you have one torch light, right? So having more of the other does not increase your level of satisfaction. So this is a scenario where we have Joy who consumes ice cream and slices of meat pie per a semester or per week, right? So to Joy, she always has to get one scoop of ice cream and one slice of pie, right, to have a given level of satisfaction. Having two scoops of ice cream and one slice of pie does not change her level of satisfaction. So this gives us a typical L-shaped indifference scale where regardless of the number of ice cream scoops of ice cream she has it doesn't change her satisfaction her satisfaction level will only change when she is given more slices of pie in addition to the ice cream so here you see that when she has two scoops of ice cream and two slices of pie her utility level increases so she shifts onto a higher indifference scale and the process continues other scenarios is when we have bats which are commodities that an individual does not like right so you don't want more of it so if you are somebody who is a light sleeper you are trying to take a nap you don't want more noise right so the more exposure to noise the lower your satisfaction so you see that satisfaction increases as you move down these indifference curves so these are this was a scenario where we have a bad compared to a good where the individual would rather want more good if on the other hand noise does not disturb you then noise is a neutral to you right so you have neutrals where the consumer does not really mind it doesn't care but cares about the other good so in this scenario we have vertical indifference curves which are going moving to the right and the more you move to the right the higher the satisfaction level so having done that now we'll look at a satiation point which is a point where every consumer ideally would want to 
B, so when you are consuming two goods, X and X2 and X1, every consumer has a mental idea of the maximum X2 they want and the maximum X1 they want. So that gives us a point of satiation. Any point devoid of the satiation point does not give the consumer the utmost satisfaction. So the consumer at any point in time would do a reallocation until they reach a point of satiation, which is the bliss point that we have over there, right? So a negatively sloped part of the consumer satiation curve would show that the consumer would be having too much of both goods, right? So they would decrease consumption to reach a point of satiation. So within here, you can tell that within this boundary, right, within this boundary, you can tell that the consumer is having what? Less of both commodities, right? But within this boundary, Right. If you go within this boundary, you can tell that the consumer has more of both X and Y that he or she doesn't like. So we do, do reduce consumption to the point where they raise the black point, which is the satiation point or the satiated preference. So within the, at this point, the consumer has no incentive to change consumption because they are satiated. Their satisfaction is at its peak.